Hello, um, today's presentation about nanoscale and ultra fast thermal imaging of gallium nitride RF devices. Um, and I'm working with my colleague, uh, Professor Peter Ayan from uh, Colorado School of Mines. And uh, we are going to discuss about some of the recent applications of thermal imaging. And so like any good presentation, a lot of this material has been developed by many of our colleagues. So I just wanna mention uh, Dr. Christian Matei, Dr. Harris Watsi, Dr. Jonas Urbanus, Urbanus, who's taken a lot of these uh, measurements uh, throughout their PhD dissertations. And also we can't forget uh, Dustin Kendig, who works for Microsanch. Okay, so as we look at thermal measurements, what we can see in uh, RF and microwave circuits is that the density of these circuits is increasing. That could either be the spacing between, um, you know, the area that the circuit takes up or the power density. In either case, what we do is we get increased heating, and this obviously impacts the reliability and the lifetime of the devices. And the, electro, uh, the electrical performance, we all know, is also impacted by thermal effects. And what my team has been doing a lot over the past 10 years is looking at how do we go ahead and develop simulation and measurement uh, techniques for a coupled electrothermal optimization. So we wanna be looking at how the temperature impacts the electrical performance and how we can go ahead and design the chips to take this into account. And this is really a complicated uh, coupled behavior because what we'll see is that if we change the chip slightly um, or how we feed it, we can get very different um, temperature distributions. So at the, on the bottom here, you'll see some thermal scans for an LDMOS device, a silicon device, where we have uh, two different temperature profiles for the same layout, just different feeding of the, of the transistor. And um, whether it's uh, you know, small changes to the input um, matching network or harmonics uh, terminations as you design your amplifier, you can get very different temperature distributions. And this is critical for us to take into account in the design and optimization of the transistor. So here is an example where an IR thermography, which is a standard, is compared with transient CCD. Um, IR has the highest uh, sensitivity, can go down to micro Kelvin with locking detection. Uh, but the real challenge is that gallium nitride is transparent to IR. Metals have low emissivity. So as a result, uh, the temp spatial resolution is limited and time resolution is limited. Uh, so as you can see on the top figure, you can see the overall heating. But when we look at uh, CCD-based thermal reflectance, we are able to see heating in individual uh, gate areas. Um, so one of the early methods that was applied uh, for temperature measurement is uh, Raman thermometry. And uh, the uh, top left-hand side shows the configuration. A laser, in this case, a green light is um, uh, focused on the sample. And in the refracted light, we measure a small Raman shift. That is what is shown in the bottom left-hand side. Uh, these tiny shifts correspond to specific uh, covalent bond vibrations, such as gallium nitride E2 or A1 uh, vibration. And what is interesting is that the position of these peaks and amplitude of them can be used to measure temperature. A beautiful example of this is shown um, on the top right-hand side, uh, early measurement by Kubold's group that shows temperature uh, down to a silicon carbide substrate at the depth of a couple of hundred micron uh, up to the top surface, the gallium nitride. Uh, so you can really see the thermal boundary resistance. While this is accurate, if you could press next, um, there is a real uh, challenge is that um, the peaks in the Raman also are affected by the stress such as inverse piezoelectric. So detailed calibration and sometimes modeling is needed to get the accurate temperature measurement. Uh, the other component of Raman is, is the point measurement. Really, uh, it takes quite a bit of time to do um, uh, an image by scanning it. But the advantage of 3D is valuable to look at the substrate effects. The next view graph uh, shows a thermal reflectance measurement system. Uh, I briefly discussed the idea is that the same optical microscope that you use to visualize your sample with the right synchronization with the light source and the device can be used to measure very slight changes in thermal reflectance and give us a sensitivity uh, of 10 minus 5 in reflection, which corresponds to a temperature sensitivity in tens of millikelvin. 
And so this is a system here on the left uh, that was installed in my former laboratory at the University of Surrey before I joined the Colorado School of Mines. And you'll see the installation here where we have this on a, on a table uh, showing the uh, imaging of uh, uh, a 74 gigahertz device that uh, I'll show uh, some measurements on in, in just a few slides. So this is one of those uh, d devices. This is a zoomed out uh, view of uh, a multi-stage uh, 74 gigahertz gas p hemp amplifier. And uh, what we did was we uh, went ahead and biased this and then we can start to look at the um, individual, uh, each one of the individual cells. Um, and what we can do now is if this is with a 5X uh, CCD image, uh, we can now go look at its pulse performance uh, at the finger level. And this is where we're going to get to see a lot of the really detailed um, heating. So at 100 uh, X magnification, we can view uh, just a few of the fingers and I'll play a movie here. We're able to go ahead and capture uh, frame by frame with the, uh, with the measurement system. And what we can start to see now is how the device heats up over time. And what you'll see, you'll see the location of the heating. Um, and if we go ahead and uh, look at this at it on a frame by frame basis, you can actually see when the fingers are heating um, themselves, uh, you know, the self heating uh, from each one of the fingers. And then you can start to see as the heat goes ahead and uh, combines and you get the mutual heating between them all. It's, uh, this is a really pretty image, but what we can do now is we can start to do a lot of data manipulation on this uh, so that we can see where the local time constants are for, for all the heating. And that's what we can look here is what we can do now uh, with the microsange system is we can go ahead and um, determine areas of interest where, we're, where we want to see the, the temperature. And you'll see in the bottom left hand corner here, we have three areas. Uh, you can define these areas. So they could be individual pixels or you could have a area or you could look at all the pixels simultaneously. Um, and what we're able to do in this uh, spots now is to pick out the overall uh, temperature within that area of interest. And at the top of the screen here, you'll see how the temperature uh, rises differently depending where you are on the device. Uh, so here you'll see uh, very different uh, delta Ts, whether you're on the gate, the drain, or, or the, uh, the, the source of the, uh, of the transistor. And then, you know, from the, uh, Delta T change and the time, you'll see the time axis there, we can go ahead and pick out the, uh, the thermal uh, time constants. And so what we're starting to see now, usually we'll measure and try to pick out an RC time constant for the entire chip. But here we're, what we're starting to see is there's very, uh, there's differences depending where you are on the chip. So as you start to develop a full electrothermal model for the entire transistor, these are some things that you might want to take into account for an overall distributed uh, thermal model. And with the microsange system, this is something that we can go ahead and, and then verify that overall model. So we're going to move a little bit now into talking about uh, gallium nitride power transistors. And here we have um, uh, a device that we bought. It's a GAN on, on silicon carbide uh, from Cree. It's a 20 finger device. Uh, with 25 watts, uh, it's a, a 30 watt uh, saturated power uh, designed to operate at 28 volts with an IDQ of 250 milliamps. Um, and here, what you can see now is a cross section. Uh, this is from one of the Cree application notes uh, where the, we expect the high temperature just on the edge of the gate nearest to the drain is. Now in these devices, there's often a field plate so when we're looking from the top down, you can't necessarily see that exact spot, but with the resolution of the uh, microsand system, we can get right into the, uh, right in between the gate and the drain, and we can start to see from the top where that heat uh, or, or originates from. So what uh, you see here is uh, one of the recent results uh, published uh, over the last year about cross-sectional thermal imaging of a gallium nitride and silicon carbide hemp. Uh, so it required you know, delicate device preparation. The top uh, image so show the CCD. You can clearly see the source drain and the gate, the gallium nitride layer and the silicon carbide. 
with the same optical imaging that you visualize it by now locking and looking at different powers and different delays on the bottom, uh, you can see uh, at two microsecond delay on B and 10 microsecond delay, um, what is the temperature profile? Uh, the top row is at the uh, power dissipation of 3.3 watt per millimeter and the bottom row is about 5.8 watt per millimeter. And what you can see is uh, for the first time, we can actually see the heating underneath the gate and we can see how the heating scales with time. The time constant is one of the things was emphasized earlier, um, but also you can see how the biasing affects this. Uh, so this was uh, quite powerful. In the next view graph, uh, what the group has done is they look at the impact of um, what happens uh, in different layers. First of all, on the left-hand side, you see the transient temperature at two locations, a gate and the gallium nitride. And here is important because all top measurements always measure the gate. And what you can see, the gallium nitride is get hotter at the beginning as expected because that's a source of heat. It has a faster time constant, but eventually after a certain time, 10 microsecond equilibrates. So you can see the time constant being different. So that's uh, quite powerful and that's quite important for validation. And what you can see on the right-hand side, uh, the same power is applied in the three cases, A, B, and C on the right-hand side. Uh, the same power of 3.3 watt per millimeter, but you can see that the V gate source goes from zero to minus 1.5 to minus 2.5. So basically you can see as you go to the pinch off how the distribution of heat changes. And again, have been quite a bit of uh, modeling work. And this is one of the first time we can visually uh, see what happens in this type of device. So that was uh, one of the recent validations. And next, what I want to describe is um, uh, how the, then the theory and experiment work. That's a, a slightly different paper by another group um, uh, from Penn State. In this case, you can see the modeling result right now. Uh, so first of all, where is the joule heating happening in the pinch off region? In this case, 2.5 watt per millimeter. Um, and you can see uh, when you are in the left-hand side, pinch off, all of the heating is near the drain. And when is on the right-hand side, is more distributed. Theoretically, uh, you would expect, uh, even though the power is the same, uh, the uh, left-hand side give you a delta T max of 38 degree, while the right-hand side is 28 degree. So that's an important point. That means uh, that thermal resistance is bias dependent. Uh, next, what you have is the actual experimental results that was obtained. This is using visible, and you can see the accuracy, 38 plus minus 0.7 or, and 28 plus minus 0.9. So is quite accurate. And this is one of the first time we could really see theory and experiment matching. So it's a validation of the theory. But what is interesting is that this is still on the metal side. This is not on the sub-micron scale. In this paper, they really wanted to understand what happened inside the transistor. In the next view graph, um, what they used is a, a, a comparison of the Fourier model with a Boltzmann, which is uh, basically subcontinuum. And what you see here is temperature profile from uh, drain on the left to source on the right. So kind of pay attention, things are reverse comparing to past. But um, the Fourier law is the dash blue line. And you can see at the power of 250 milliwatt, uh, the hottest point is about 45 degree or so. And at 500 milliwatt, the hottest point is close to 100 degree. But that's what Fourier predicts. Now the Boltzmann average with some sort of uh, um, subcontinuum and a mean free path, which is given here by uh, numbers 84 nanometer or 400 nanometer, uh, predict um, uh, heating that go up to about 120 degrees. And you can see there's a difference between Fourier and non-Fourier is substantial. 20 degrees, uh, it's a uh, you know, factor of for in lifetime easily. So that's quite important. And if you click next, you see a data point here that was obtained by UV uh, transient uh, thermoreflectance imaging. The advantage of UV when you go to 365 nanometers, you have a signal on gallium nitride near the top surface. And you can see that matches quite well the subcontinuum and is much hotter than the uh, continuum. And this was a paper that they really um, 
uh, emphasize the importance, what create degradation is often not highest temperature, but temperature gradients. So knowing in this case what happens under the gate between distances of 1.5 to 5 micron is quite important. And um, uh, uh, it also shows the advantage. And one of the comments the paper had is that if you use Raman for the same device, you can also get a result in gallium nitride, but is volume average over a region of a few microns. So you cannot really get the peak temperature. So this is another advantage of this technique. So one of the things we were really interested to see um, is to see how these devices, um, we could measure them in a load pool system. And so what you're showing here is um, some work where there's a, an impedance transformer designed with a TRL calibration. And what you can see on the bottom of the image is where the um, gallium nitride device and its package is inserted into the system. Um, and what we do for measurements is we'll remove the lid so that we can go ahead and then see down on the gallium nitride uh, device itself and then do the thermal reflectance measurements. So um, as I'll show here shortly, this is gonna be embedded in an NVNA load pool uh, system. And then we'll do uh, measurements and we can either take those at the connector plane or through the TRL, the embedding, get right down to the edge of the packages. And that's what you're looking at here. This is a schematic of the overall system. So with the, uh, you'll, you'll see the, at the bottom, this is the thermal stage here uh, with, the, with the lens from the, uh, the, the microSAN system. And here we have, the system has a 50 nanosecond temporal resolution. So this is an incredibly fast imaging. We can actually see the transient heat evolve uh, in the, uh, as we do the measurement. Um, and it's embedded into a, a load pull system where we have a source and load tuners with couplers just before the transistor uh, test fixture. And then this is all connected to a PNAX. Um, and the system that we built and designed uh, has um, a capability up to 18 gigahertz, uh, half kilowatt pulsed and uh, doing this all in an NVNA style measurement so that we can get not only the fundamentals, but the harmonics as well. An image of the full integrated system is here. You'll see the source and load, load tuners that you can identify on either side of the, uh, the image. And then the thermal stage of the microSANG system is right in the middle. And that's all connected then to an AMCAD pulse IV system so that we can pulse on and off the device. And then the uh, PNAX is uh, behind the, uh, the microscope uh, that's above the thermal stage. And then the uh, rest of the electronics for the thermal reflectance system are on the, uh, the right-hand side. So this whole system then allows us to uh, do the measurements that we're gonna show here in, in just a moment. So one of the things that we did uh, was first, we zoomed in on a finger and we wanted to see where the heat was being generated. And so you'll see on the right-hand side, uh, the, uh, the image of one of the, the fingers where we're gonna zoom in. And then in the bottom left-hand corner, what you'll see is along the top finger, that's the, uh, the gate. And you'll see just as predicted by the uh, simulations that Ellie showed earlier, you can see that the, the heat is being generated right at the edge of that gate. Um, and so this was a steady state uh, measurement where we, uh, we, we biased the device and, and we looked uh, to see, you know, what the, the temperature would be under steady state conditions. And then we went ahead and started to look at specific measurements. So here we're looking at, um, at uh, we've tuned the fundamental for, uh, at the load for uh, maximum output power. Uh, we didn't have a harmonic tuning capability, so we probably could have gotten a little bit better in the drain efficiency. Uh, had we had that, but still uh, what we were interested here to see how the device behaves under steady state conditions. And as we look at each one of the individual fingers, so we have the nice image from above. This is we're uh, calibrating now on the gallium and measuring on the gallium nitride. So this is the, you know, the top layer of the device is translucent. We get right down to the GAN and the, the temperature right at the two deg. And what you'll see here is a graph on the bottom where we've numbered each one of the individual fingers. 
And what you can see is the temperature distribution uh, across the device. And you'll see that it's, uh, it's pretty constant uh, across the overall device. Um, you know, indicating that it's a, it's a pretty well, um, all the fingers are, are well spaced out and under transient, um, these steady state conditions, everything uh, behaves kind of as we would expect. As we get into the transient measurements, what we're going to do now is the, the device, uh, we're going to measure it with that 50 nanosecond uh, resolution. And in the bottom image that I'm showing here, um, this is a movie as, as we heat up the device. And what you'll see now, if you watch the movie on the top where we do a cross section, you'll see that some of the fingers do actually heat up a little bit asymmetric. Um, and that's something that uh, if you're going to design for memory effects, each one of those transistor fingers has a slightly different thermal environment than each one, than, uh, they're not, even though they're all laid out identical, the fingers themselves due to their local environment are slightly different. So there's an asymmetry here that you, uh, you might wanna take into account and you only really see this under these uh, transient uh, imaging uh, conditions. And in this measurement, we're measuring for the first 200 uh, microseconds in 10 microsecond steps. And finally, uh, we wanted to present some of the latest uh, work where we're, we were looking at using uh, gallium nitride devices, but in this case, using them in uh, power conversion applications. Um, and here, um, Christian Matei designed um, using the same GAN hemp device, um, used the device as a switching transistor. And um, the idea here was to create a 20 to 40 volt DC-DC uh, boost converter. And uh, he was able to, you know, find some an example of this in the literature, uh, reconstruct and design this uh, device, and then we went ahead and implemented this inside of a, 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 you know, with the thermal stage that I'm showing in the image above, the CCD camera connecting an oscilloscope and a power supply, and here the idea is to be able to go ahead and measure the um, the temperature on each one of the fingers as the device switches. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna show on the next page here. You know, what we did in the first case in the upper right-hand corner, um, we went ahead and we calculated, um, you know, this is at a few megahertz. We, in a, under class A bias conditions, you can see in the top graph, the drain current and the drain voltage. And if we multiply those two together, this is really the dissipated power. And that's what we're seeing in the red curve, right? In the red area. And we assembled a, a full model of this, a thermal model. And so it's an electrothermal model where we take the power dissipated by the transistor fingers. And then we go ahead and combine that with the thermal model inside of uh, yes, We do a, a electrothermal simulation. And what we can see now is that the measurement from the microsand system is giving us the exact same um, dynamic temperature that we're seeing um, um, in the simulation. So this is pretty fantastic because as we have an amplifier here, what we're measuring now in most measurement systems, what you'll measure is the average temperature. Here, what we're doing at one megahertz and later at five megahertz is a measurement where we're actually seeing the dynamic overlap between the I and V curves in the transistor itself. And so going back then to the boost converter, what we are, what, what uh, Christian Mate did was he looked at the, um, the, the design of it and you'll see the uh, drain current versus uh, drain voltage so that we can see the device as it's switching on and off. And from that, we can calculate then the dissipated power. And that's the, the uh, image in the bottom left-hand corner where you'll see the drain power dissipation under two different um, conditions, under a one megahertz switching and five megahertz switching. And what we can do then is we can go ahead and take the full dye. So we have a model now for the full dye, the electrothermal that we, the one that we used above in the class A but now we're using it, uh, the same model under switching conditions in the boost converter. And what you're seeing here for the first time for one of these boost converters is uh, a prediction that the, you'll see the simulations in the dashed black lines in the bottom right-hand corner versus the, uh, the, the measurements uh, that are shown in the colored lines 
of the temperature or the dynamic IV overlap at the drain. So that's creating the dissipated power for each one of the individual fingers in the transistor. And now we can detect and see how that temperature changes as the device switches on and off. Um, so we're now we're peering into the device and seeing how the temperature operates. And if you're designing a boost converter, um, rather than looking at what is traditionally done, the average temperature, here we're able to look at the overall instantaneous temperature within the device as it's operating. Um, so that was uh, some of our latest work, and it's pretty fantastic to see, one, the resolution of the system, and two, the, uh, the accuracy that we're getting compared to the models. So with that, Ellie, I'll maybe uh, I'll leave this to you to maybe start some summary comments. Uh, thank you, Peter. You know, these are, you know, outstanding results. Uh, uh, one should pay attention, not only the time scale, but the temperature changes that happen on the order of a few degrees within a few microseconds. And uh, of course, when theory and experiment match, this is a good indication that we have a good understanding where power dissipation happened, but also where are some of the thermal properties of the materials. Um, and I think, uh, you know, as we push the devices to higher speeds and higher powers, um, uh, the feature sizes uh, uh, of devices are submicron. So we really need uh, advanced techniques to be able to characterize, calibrate the models. Um, for example, there is a, a big push on the gallium nitride devices uh, for more advanced uh, substrate or uh, interface layers. And there's always uh, unknowns when you measure a total thermal resistance, um, uh, where it's coming from, there could be multiple factors and the transient uh, temperature profile is almost like a radar. It tells you where the heat goes and we can use that um, to uh, better model different layers as was uh, shown earlier. So hopefully uh, this uh, examples here shows the potential of full imaging that is high speed and um, uh, high resolution, spatial resolution. Of course, there is always uh, potential to do complementary measurement using Raman or IR. And uh, we look forward to uh, hear more from industry partners. What are the areas where we need to push the limits of these techniques? What are the areas of device applications where the coupled electrothermal um, analysis uh, could be beneficial? So we look forward to hear from uh, um, our industry partners, uh, uh, some of the inputs they have. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Peter, also for your time. Thank you, Ellie.